it seems like our uh, participant count has stabilized. So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is David Ortiz. I am the faculty fellow for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies CLABS here at NMSU. And we are really happy to welcome you, bienvenidos todos, to our spring 2022 speaker series. Uh, today we have the first of our three speaker series uh, speakers for this series in the spring. Um, I want you to know that in the chat right now we are putting all of our social media presence. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, or on um, YouTube, you can. Um, you, if you sign up for any of those three channels, what you will do is you will be, uh, you will know beforehand when these events will happen and what they will be. We will also, we are also putting in the chat our upcoming events. So the rest of our spring 2022 speaker series events are two coming speakers. Um, you can find them there and then you can register there too for those events. And finally, uh, in the chat is also our mailing list. If you click on that, then you will be part of our mailing list and we could let you know via email if you're interested in participating in any of these events. So thank you for sponsoring us. Thank you for being here. Muchas gracias. Les agradecemos de todo corazón. Um, before we begin, I wanted to let you know a couple of things about this webinar. Um, just uh, quickly, you, if you need a live transcript, it will be at the bottom uh, of your screen where it says live transcript. You can click that on or off. If you're bothered by the live transcript, by the CC captions, um, by the, the closed captions, you can uh, turn them off. Or if you want the closed captions, you can turn them on. So. I uh, just wanted to let you know about that. If you need them, they're there for you so that you can have those on. Um, the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about was there's a Q&A button. In this webinar, we will let our speaker uh, do the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, we, we will field the questions for you. Um, what you can do is whenever you think about the uh, question, during the presentation, it's perfectly fine. You don't have to wait till the end. Just click that Q&A button and uh, post your question. When you post your question, either Yvette Navarro, our CLABS GA or myself will respond to you saying if your question will be uh, handled live or if we will actually answer it on the spot via the Q&A button. So please, Feel free to use that Q&A button, use it early, use it often. Uh, I know that our guest speaker today, Dr. Buccelli, is really, really happy to field all your questions and is excited about it. So, um, so please, please do use that. Uh, finally, I wanted to now introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker for today is Dr. Jose Buccelli. Jose, how are you? There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, thank you everyone, um, for being here. And I look forward to sharing my research with you. Excellent. So let me give you a quick introduction to Dr. Buccelli. Dr. Buccelli is an assistant professor of economics in the Department of Economics, Applied Statistics, and International Business here at New Mexico State University. So we're very proud that he's one of our very own. Um, his research addresses topics at the intersection of labor, development and migration economics. Some of his recent work has explored the impact of returning migration on development in Mexico and the effects of US migration policies on immigrant outcomes. And in fact, that's some of the things that we will learn today. Originally from Ecuador, Dr. Buccelli obtained his PhD in economics at the University of New Mexico in 2019 and spent a year as a visiting fellow at the UC San Diego Center for US-Mexican Studies. So it is our honor to have Dr. Jose Buccelli uh, in our speaker series today. And I will uh, close my camera and leave uh, the room to Dr. Buccelli. Thank you so much for being here with us.
Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I want to start by thanking the, the center for this wonderful opportunity to not only share my research with all of the, the attendees, but to talk about, to create this space, to talk about a very important topic on the unintended consequences of U.S. border and interior immigration policies. Um, again, I'm, I'm in the Department of Economics, Supply Statistics and International Business here at NMSU, and I want to thank everybody for attending my presentation. I look forward to your questions at the end. I'm going to be talking about uh, my research throughout this presentation, but what I want you to keep in mind is while each one of the projects that I'm going to be talking about uh, focuses on a single change in a policy, uh, and we are actually able to measure those changes um, in policies on several outcomes, what I want you to keep in mind is that when we start to put these results together, a more complete picture is going to emerge, and that's where I want our conversation um, to lead. And that's actually what I plan to do today. So let, let me start by talking. Um, we're giving a very brief introduction as what is it that we're talking about when we say immigration enforcement and border um, security or, or border policies. So since 9-11, um, after the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, the country has witnessed an unprecedented increase in border and interior immigration enforcement. In the graph, we see the budget allocated to Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, so the agencies in charge of enforcing the immigration law. We see that in 2003, the budget was not even $10 billion. We see then a fast increase towards the end of the decade, where we end with about $18 billion. Throughout the Obama administration, it, it stabilized at, at around $18 billion, but then we have the Trump administration and finally it ends uh, fiscal year 2021 with a budget of $26 billion a year allocated to the enforcement of immigration law at the border and inside the country. Overall, this is $330 billion that were spent on immigration enforcement since 2003. Now, you might be wondering why was all this money spent on? Well, mainly, um, first, keep in mind that Congress has not passed uh, comprehensive immigration reform. So the executive branch, the president, through executive orders or other departments, um, the individual states and even localities across the country have adopted several measures. One of them being uh, secure communities in which uh, the biometric information for those uh, individuals who have been detained by local law enforcement is sent over to the FBI. The FBI shares that information with the, Dep the Department of Homeland Security, and that allows um, the government to identify unauthorized immigrants. This program started being rolled out in 2008. It was quickly replaced by the Priority Enforcement Program, or PEP, in 2015-17. It was only a name change. It essentially kept the same uh, functions, and then President Trump reinstated Secure Community um, in its original form. Another big program is the 287G agreements between ICE and local or state law enforcement agencies in which ICE deputizes the enforcement of immigration law to those local law, law enforcement agencies. Uh, at the same time, individual states have passed or enacted uh, pieces of legislation to address immigration uh, and immigration enforcement. For example, Arizona's SB 1070 with the show me your papers clauses in which uh, police actually was able to profile individuals based on their physical appearance to inquire about their immigration status. And finally, more employment-based measures such as the E-Verify uh, program in which potential or employers can um, screen potential uh, hires uh, for their employment um, authorization in the U.S. So overall, these measures aimed at curbing the number of unauthorized immigrants already in the country or that are attempting to cross the border have resulted in over 5 million deportations between the years of 2002 and 2020. So since the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. When I say 5 million deportations, I want you to keep in mind that the, the entire population of El Salvador is 6 million people. So this is almost like deporting an entire country. And another thing is that most migrants have been deported without even a conviction. So there's this narrative that many of these migrants that were deported, for example, under secure communities were criminals. But if we see, a, a, if we take a look at the data, what we see here is the number of deportations every year. In the blue uh, bars, we see those who were not convicted and 
the bars indicate the percentage of individuals who were not convicted and those who were convicted. What we see is that there is a very large uh, or large proportion of individuals that were never convicted of any crime and that still were deported. Now, if we break down uh, those individuals who were convicted, for example, in 2003, 53% of those who were deported, we see that ICE classifies those convictions into three levels, with level one being the most serious, for example, treason, espionage, smuggling, terrorism, homicide, and so on. In the level three, we have the misdemeanors, where ICE considers a criminal conviction if you enter the country illegally. So illegal entry or DUIs, traffic offenses, or drug position, minor uh, misdemeanors. So what we see is that even those um, among those individuals who were convicted, the vast majority of them were convicted because of entering the country illegally or re-entering the country illegally, not because of serious crimes. Now, why should we care about these measures, this, um, this population? The first is the size of the unauthorized immigrant population. According to the Department of Homeland Security or the Migration Policy Institute or the Pew Research Center, the size of the unauthorized immigrant population ranges between 10.5 to 11.5 million people. So these are, uh, um, there's a lot of individuals who are at risk of deportation and family separation. And that leads me to my second um, argument, why should we care? Because immigration policies impact authorized immigrants and even U.S. citizens. For example, approximately 130,000 parents of U.S.-born children were deported between 2014 and 2017. These are individuals who were born in the U.S. and were separated from their parents due to deportation. Still, over 4 million U.S. citizen children have one or more unauthorized immigrant parents and are at risk uh, for this family separation. If we look at the entire literature or the research on, on this topic, we see that there's evidence of negative effects on many dimensions, including employment and wages, educational attainment, household poverty, children's living arrangements, civic engagement, and even political representation of US citizens. And I'm gonna be talking about some of these outcomes today. So I have two objectives with this presentation. The first one is to improve our understanding of the impact of immigration enforcement policies on immigrants, but most importantly, to raise awareness about the consequences, the unintended consequences for families and children, including those born in the US. So this is um, the presentation outline that I'm gonna be following. I will be talking about four of my most uh, recent uh, papers. The first one is going to be looking at border enforcement and unaccompanied minors. Then I will be talking about immigration enforcement and educational outcomes, followed by uh, immigration enforcement and congressional representation. And then to end on a more positive note, I will look at safe zone policies and educational outcomes of children. So allow me to start with the first one. Border enforcement and uh, unaccompanied minors. So we have already probably heard in the news lately how the increased flow of unaccompanied minors is a so-called crisis that the government must address. Well, let's talk about those numbers. So um, this graph shows the number of apprehensions per fiscal year of unaccompanied minors at the border by Border Patrol. So we see that in 2010, Border Patrol detained 18,000 unaccompanied minors. The number declined a little bit the following year, but then it has increased. In 2014, it reached 68,000 uh, unaccompanied minors detained at the board. Then it decreased a little bit, but it remained stable. And then in 2019, in uh, 2020, and even this year, it has continued to increase. In 2019, it was 76,000, which actually leads to a 300% increase between 2010 and 2019. Now, if we think about the root causes of child migration, what is causing this flow of unaccompanied minors to the US? On the one hand, we have poverty and violence. So we know that there is a lot of violence in Central America, especially the Northern Triangle, the countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. But these countries are not only facing um, a lot of criminal activity, a lot of violence, uh, gang activity, but they're also facing a fast population uh, growth. Uh, they have high fertility rates. They have a large share of the population younger than 18. So these are people who are starting to look for uh, economic opportunities, and unfortunately, they have not been able to find them in their home countries. 
Um, we also have environmental reasons. So since 2014, uh, extreme drought conditions increased food insecurity and, and child malnutrition. So it's not only teenagers, but actually infants and children um, um, who are exposed to these conditions. And also we have large diasporas already living in the US, especially Salvadorans, for example. So there is a high likelihood of family reunification now that they have uh, that the parents have established in the US, they have found jobs, homes, they are trying to reunify uh, with their children. And now uh, a, a second area of these root causes of child migration to the US is actually the, the uh, objective of this presentation, which is looking at US policies. So one of them, for example, the 2014 Obama administration's Central American Minors Refugee and Parole Program, or CAMP, was designed to reunite children with parents in the US. And if you remember from the graph that I showed in the previous slides, we actually see a decline because what this program did is they, uh, they implemented the program in the home countries and they allowed children to travel to the US legally to be reunited with their parents. So that uh, the incentive to cross the border illegally was reduced. We also have DACA um, that, uh, that uh, actually created a legal status for over or almost a million undocumented students or undocumented um, children living in the US. But also I wanna draw your attention to the fact that policies that have uh, been traditionally used against single adult Mexicans, which was the bulk of the uh, unauthorized flows arriving to the country, for example, through voluntary returns and apprehensions, did not evolve to manage the flows of families and children. So all of a sudden authorities realized that they have not adapted those, those tools, those techniques, and they are having basically to improvise, to come up with new policies. And one of those policies that I want to focus on in this first uh, paper is the zero tolerance policy. So as a brief background, in April of 2018, then U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced a zero tolerance policy aimed at curtailing the growing flows of family units reaching the border. Now, it's important that we think about family units because these families were actually crossing the border and turning themselves into Border Patrol in order to request for asylum. Until then, those unauthorized border crossers, not considered enforce, enforcement priorities, were typically placed in civil removal proceedings for unauthorized presence. So they were deported, but they were not criminally prosecuted. Now, under the zero tolerance policy, all adults entering without authorization or crossing the border were criminally prosecuted, regardless of whether they traveled with children or even whether they were going to apply for asylum. They were going to be criminally prosecuted. So what happened was that the Department of Justice placed adults in federal criminal facilities, and this is very important, this part. Children, if, if, if it was a family, the adults were placed in federal criminal facilities, but their children were separated from their parents, and then they were reclassified as an unaccompanied, and they were referred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement under um, Health and Human Services. We all remember the news from, uh, from 2018, right? How children were separated from their families, the conditions that they were kept in. So after they, this public outrage, President Trump issued an executive order ending the policy a couple of months later. Now, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that seemingly benevolent policies were actually retooled to separate these families. So we started with the Flores Settlement Agreement in 1997, according to which children under the government custody were to be held in the quote unquote, uh, least restrictive city. That meant not jails. Then the Homeland Security Act in 2002, under this law, it transferred the processing and care of those unaccompanied minors from Immigration and Naturalization Service to the Office of Refugee Resettlement so that they could access better care. And then finally, in 2008, we have the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, in which minors from contiguous countries, that means Mexico, were to be repatriated, they were sent back to Mexico if there were no grounds for asylum. On the other hand, minors from non-contiguous countries, so El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, were to be transferred over to ORR custody within 72 hours of apprehension. Finally, in 2018, what happened was that once, so all unlawful border crossers were criminally prosecuted regardless of their intention to apply for asylum. So adults were detained in, in jails again, Children were separated, and reclassified as an accompany, and referred to the um, Office of Refugee Resettlement. Some of the adults were deported even without the knowledge of where their children were. 
So what we do in this study is we access data by Border Patrol on the detention of, uh, of an accompanied minors by month and by nationality. And I wanna draw your attention to um, the three vertical bars that we have first when the Trump administration begins, we see that there is a drop in the number of unaccompanied minors, but then we see that implementation of the zero tolerance policy in April of 2018 and then the repeal, but we actually have that spike in the middle that affected the Northern Triangle countries. Northern Triangle, remember, is El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. But we see that this policy did not, it's not correlated with changes in the Mexican uh, children that were detained at the border. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see if, these, uh, if this spike was actually caused by the zero tolerance policy, by that separation between parents and their children. So we also access data from the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So these are children that have already been separated from their families and referred to the government custody. And again, we see that there is that spike uh, for the Northern Triangle children, but not for Mexican children. And, and it's, you can see that it's very clearly located within the application of the policy. So what we do here is, well, we consider there are different things, not only the policy change, there are different things that could have changed during this time, different um, levels of violence at home, different levels of development, different um, levels of child mortality, for example, labor opportunities, and even enforcement at the border. So what we do is through regression analysis, we're going to control for all of these factors, and we're going to identify the effect that the activation of the policy had on the Northern Triangle children. And what we see is that there was a 77% increase in the apprehensions of minors from the Northern Triangle relative to those from Mexico with the implementation of the zero tolerance policy. So very, very large effects. Now, our next question is, or we are interested not only in the number of children that were, um, that were, that were separated from their families and then were placed under government custody, but also the duration in custody under the government. So what we do is we examine how the policy um, alter the duration in, in, government in government custody. So what this graph is showing is the share of individuals not discharged from or custody over time. And we have split this by the pre-CTP, so before the policy was activated with a continuous black line and the dashed line, uh, the gray line indicating when the policy was active. So the way you will read this graph is, let's say that after 60 days, after the uh, children were placed in government detention, if, this, if we're looking at the period before the policy, there was only a 20% probability that the child had not been discharged. But with the activation of the policy, we see that that probability doubles to 40%. Um, and so after 60 days, there was a 40% probability that the child had not been discharged. Now, it's not only the duration in custody, but also the probability that they were reunified with their families, which is actually what we look at next. So this graph shows or examines how the policy implementation altered children's prospects of being reunified with them. So the line show the share of individuals reunified uh, with their parents. And again, we have the pre-policy and during the policy. So what we see is that at that 60-day mark, uh, before the policy was activated, 78% of children had been reunified with their families um, after 60 days. But when the policy was in place, only half of the children had been reunified after 60 days. And what's wor most worrisome here, if you look at the end, even a year later, only 80% of children that had been separated during the policy had been reunified a year later after they were separated. In fact, there are still children today that have not been reunified with their families. So what are some of the lessons that we find in this uh, or that we draw from this paper? So while the aim of the policy was to stem the arrival of families, it actually resulted in the separation of thousands of children from their parents and their detention in government facilities. So we argue that this might have been a self-inflicted wound in which the government actually created this crisis. Even today, um, over 1,700 children have not been, uh, have not been reunited uh, with their parents including in this category is very interesting, 280 with no confirmed contact information available. What that means is that the government does not have information on the parents, um, so they cannot contact, they don't know who the, these children belong to. And this was actually data published in November of last year. So this crisis continues to this day. 
So I want you to keep in mind that well-intentioned legislation actually can be used to harm the well-being of asylum seekers, particularly children like those in this case. So given the potential social, emotional, behavioral, and health implications of, of separations, of course, further attention to the implications of adopting harsh immigration enforcement policies is well warranted and needed. Now, it's not only children who are coming into the country that, Im that immigration enforcement is affecting. It is also affecting the educational outcomes of children who are already in the country. And I wanna uh, start this segment with, a, with an account of uh, an ice raid that took place in Las Cruces in 2017. So journalistic accounts showed that there was, there was this raid in a trailer park, and they know that absences in the public school system spiked by 60% in the days following the raid. As a consequence of this operation, it is estimated that approximately 2,000 students in the Las uh, Cruces public school systems uh, miss at least a day of school. Now, this was in one town in New Mexico, or one city in New Mexico. Now, think about the national impact. We talked about at the beginning for those 5 million deportations between 2002 and 2020. So now imagine the impact that that would have on, on, on students. ICE alone, for example, conducted approximately half a million arrests in the U.S. interior between 2014 and 2018. And in fact, in this part of the patent or in this project, we focus on these deportations or arrests conducted by ICE. And I also want to draw your attention here about how these immigration enforcement policies are actually targeting Hispanics specifically. So individuals of Latino descent, for example, compose 77% of the unauthorized immigrant population, but they represent over 95% of deported immigrants. This is because authorities often rely on personal characteristics such as ethnicity and occupation to judge individuals' legal status. For example, if you're Hispanic, an individual in a low-wage occupation, and if you have a police record, then you're significantly more likely to be perceived as unauthorized immigrants by the general population, but also by immigration authorities. Now, these efforts, uh, these efforts to that target specifically um, Hispanics obstruct their human capital accumulation. So children are not investing in their education as much. It alters schools' demographic compositions and widen um, existing academic disparities. So what we do in this project is we collect information on the number of ICE arrests by month in each metropolitan statistical area in the U.S. between 2014 and 2018. This map that you're seeing uh, right now shows the aggregate, or not the aggregate, but um, through the entire period, so between 2014 and 2018, for each individual uh, metropolitan statistical area. And that is showing the, the rate of ICE arrest per 1,000 foreign born. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab this data and we're going to ask, well, in those metropolitan statistical areas where we see more ICE activity, do we see Hispanic students suffering the consequences? So what we do is we use individual level data from the current population survey. Um, we look at Hispanic youth between the ages of 16 and 24, and we are interested in whether those individuals were enrolled in school the week prior to the survey date. And here's what we find. So first we measure the impact on all Hispanics. What we see is that if ICE arrests increase or ICE arrests per 1,000 foreign born people, so we take into account the size of the foreign born population in each metropolitan statistical area, what we see is that if there is an increase in the rate of ICE arrests, there is a decrease in school enrollment among Hispanics between the ages of 16 and 24, and the, we observe the, the same effects if we split the sample by age, so 16 to 18, most likely um, individuals still in high school, and Hispanics between the ages of 19 and 24 in a college, in, uh, that is the college age population. So overall, an increase in the local rate of arrest uh, lowers school enrollment among Hispanics. And we also control here for individual and household characteristics, so age, gender, their foreign born status, whether the individual has graduated high school, the number of siblings, whether they live in a single parent household, and even family income. We're also interested in on the impact on Hispanics by birthplace. And I wanna draw your attention to the bottom um, two rows where we have first the effect of arrest among US born. So this means that even if you're a US born Hispanic, you were born in this country, you are gonna be negatively affected by immigration enforcement. 
you are going to probably be less likely to attend school. And also, especially if you're a foreign born, so both US born and foreign born Hispanics suffer a drop in enrollment when we have increased immigration enforcement activity in a city. We also explore their results by gender, and we see that women are actually more affected. Um, so um, this immigration enforcement or the unintended consequences of immigration enforcement actually have a gender dimension as well, where women tend to be more affected. And finally, well, if you remember, one of my arguments was that immigration enforcement is actually targeting Hispanics. We want to verify that that's the case by looking at uh, the impact on other groups, the same ICE arrest effect on other groups. So we look at non-Hispanic whites, uh, Blacks, and Asians, and what we find is that there is no effect among these other groups, meaning that immigration enforcement appears to only affect Hispanics. So what are some of the lessons that we uh, draw from this study? Yes, immigration-related arrests hinder school enrollment. Um, there, uh, part, we find that particularly vulnerable groups include youth between the ages of 19 and 24, the foreign born, and those living in a mixed status family. So people who were born in the US but have immigrant parents. The effect does not seem to be present in other racial or ethnic groups. And finally, the US immigration enforcement strategy seems to reinforce the institutional and structural barriers for upward and intergenerational mobility among Hispanics by hindering investments in their education. Now, when I say intergenerational mobility, it's not only this generation that we're talking about, and it's not only their educational outcomes that, that we're talking about, but also the uh, future generations and even their political representation in Congress. And that's actually our third study. So in this study, we're, uh, we're gonna look at immigration enforcement and congressional representation. Um, so we look at what happens or how is immigration policy affecting Hispanic representation in national elections. So again, uh, let me start with a brief introduction here. We know that Hispanics, according to the, the, the latest information available, Hispanics make up 18% of the total U.S. population. But if we look at members of Congress, they only represent 10% of them in both parties. So does the, the question that we ask here is, does immigration enforcement play a role in the underrepresentation of Hispanics? And to be honest here, there are two hypotheses that, that we thought about. On the one hand, we say, well, US citizens, which you must be to run for Congress, um, it is very hard to link immigration enforcement, which seemingly targets uh, non-citizens. But if you are a US citizen um, and you're not the target of immigration enforcement, this enforcement can still negatively affect, uh, especially Hispanics here, because we see that it might obstruct their political viability and mobilization. So this means that if there is an immigration enforcement in a certain um, congressional district, for example, the electorate might see Hispanic candidates as less viable, less likely to win, and therefore may suppress their support for those candidates. On the other hand, there's this hypothesis that it could have a positive effect if it actually increases, if more immigration enforcement or the targeting of Hispanic increases the resolve of communities affect, afflicted by these policies and actually encourages Hispanic candidates to run um, and to change these policies. Now, before I, I show you more results, I wanna point out that research on this area is only becoming more important. Hispanics are uh, uh, have actually become the the largest minority group in the electorate. We still see that they are underrepresented in national elections. They, they, um, they are aware of the problems faced, of the situations faced by, by their communities. And more than anything, what I want to show here is that actually the government could influence outcomes of elections, could influence the diversity in our elected bodies using immigration enforcement policies. So let me show you how we did that. So we created a database with all candidates participating in general elections to the US House of Representatives. And we have information on race, ethnicity, and so on. So we have several measures of, of diversity for these candidates over between the elections in 2008 and 2018. And what we do is we're, we construct an index that captures several overlapping immigration enforcement measures that I talked about at the beginning. The Secure Communities Program, 287G agreements, E-Verify, and Omnibus immigration laws. And when we create this index, we 
come up or recreate this database that, that looks like the map below. So that is just showing one year, but we do this for every year. So the darker colors show the congressional districts in which we have more of these uh, immigration enforcement policies activated. So we see that in Arizona, for example, we have the highest concentration of, this, uh, of these immigration policies. So what the question that we ask is, is this activation or is this intensification in immigration enforcement, enforcement having an effect on the representation of Hispanics during national elections? Here's what we find. First, we find that the tougher climate created by these policies curtailed Hispanic share in the candidate pool. So we actually find very negative effect of the adoption of immigration enforcement policies on the willingness or the probability or the share of Hispanics running uh, for Congress. The impact appears to be more harmful during midterm elections. This could be because the stakes are lower during midterm elections than during presidential elections. And in localities without a sanctuary policy, and I'm actually going to be talking more about this, but it does look like there are policies that can protect uh, immigrants and their communities from these unintended consequences, one of them being sanctuary policies. Also, the effect is not observed for other underrepresented groups in politics. Again, we ask the question, is this targeting Hispanics exclusively? So we rerun the analysis by looking at non-Hispanic Blacks and Asians, and even during primary elections, and we do not find any effects on, on other groups other than Hispanics. Now, one, one of the problems here is that it's not only Hispanics that uh, are being affected in the sense that uh, they are less willing to run for Congress, but we see that when they are less willing to run for Congress and they create that a vacuum, that vacuum is filled in by non-Hispanic whites, not by other minorities. Uh, we find that one of the crucial channels is diminished electoral support. So we look, uh, we find that there's a lower likelihood to win elections. So it might be the case that people see them as less viable and therefore uh, are less likely to support Hispanic candidates. Most importantly, our findings show that those coercive efforts aimed at curtailing unauthorized immigration have actually undermined the participation of U.S. citizen Hispanics in national politics. So with Hispanics now representing the largest minority group of eligible voters, I think that understanding how intensified immigration enforcement efforts affects their engagement in the national politics is more important than, than ever. But equally as important is to understand what policies can counteract the harmful effects that these immigration enforcement policies are having. And this is where um, I want to, uh, my, my last paper, I wanted to um, finish on a sort of a positive note. Uh, yes, there are very harmful negative consequences, or unintended consequences of immigration policies. But like I said in the previous slide, there are also policies that can help shield immigrants in their communities or even U.S. citizens from these harmful effects. So in this study um, called Safe Zone Schools and the Academic Performance of Children in Mixed Status Households, we conducted a study called the Between the Lines, uh, the Lines Study where we actually collected survey information. We matched that to certain policies adopted by schools, and then uh, we measure the outcome. So let me tell you about this study. So I already mentioned that over 4 million US citizen children have one or more unauthorized immigrant parents. And I wanna come back to this uh, statistic because it means, this means that there are over 4 million US born children who are at risk of family separation. That is family separation, we know that comes with high risk of economic hardship, for example, of food insecurity, housing instability. So we are actually, or the government or immigration authorities are actually punishing these children by uh, deporting their parents. There's also uh, literature on parental deportation and separation, um, and they find that there's psychological and emotional trauma. They've actually have identified PTSD symptoms among children who have been separated from their parents. They have identified anxiety, depression, and aggression among these children. So the question that we ask here is, well, maybe policies that provide a safe environment for children could make a difference, especially if they're adopted by schools where children spend most of the time and acquire a lot of their human capital. So how are, uh, how are uh, schools responding to the intensified immigration enforcement? Well, to mitigate the trauma and the distress from immigration enforcement, that separation from their parents, 
Many school districts have implemented what are called the safe zone policies. These are also known as sanctuary policies, but it's very important that we understand that this is at the school district level. So what these policies do is, well, some of them prohibit cooperation with immigration authorities. Some will say ICE cannot uh, come into campus, so is barring ICE from campus, or we will not share information with immigration authorities. Some will not even collect, they prohibit the collection of information that might allow someone else to determine the immigration status of, of children. Other safe zone policies have established procedures for when a student's caregiver is detained or deported. What is um, the contact list for this student, the emergency contacts? What are the procedures? What would parents want us to do? What or the caregivers would want us to do? So they have established those procedures. Other policies or um, other school districts offer counseling and legal information. They realize that sometimes what they what these students need is actually access to information. How to apply to DACA, for example, how to apply to college without a social security number, things like that. Um, some resolutions actually have avoided using the term safe zone, even when they provide all of these services or include all of these components, they actually avoid using terms like safe zone or sanctuary, especially during the Trump administration to circumvent the, the threats that were made by the administration to cut funding to these schools. Um, and almost all of these uh, safe zone resolutions or policies have been motivated by the Supreme Court ruling in Plyler v. Doe, 1982, with, which was adopted or passed uh, with the aim to protect the right of all students, regardless of their immigration status, to access public education. So in this paper, we investigate the role of those safe zone policies in protecting children's educational outcomes. So to do that, we conducted a, a survey. So the, we call it the Between the Lines or BTL survey. This is a two-year bi-national study of families subjected to parental deportation or at risk of parental deportation with survey data pertaining to three period, uh, different time periods. So uh, this information was collected at deportation stations located in Mexican border towns of Tijuana, Nogales, and Matamoros. So this is when individuals were deported, um, enumerators approached these individuals, interviewed them, and this is the P1 enclosed in the red box. In, in the diagram. So this is the time of parental deportation between 2019 and 2020. The survey was completed by the deported parents, by their children. You, very important to keep this in mind. These children are U.S. born citizens. They, they were left behind in the U.S. when their parents were removed. And an adult caregiver with, with whom they were left in the U.S. They are contacted six months later and we see that change um, in the outcomes. And very importantly, during that T1 period, we also collect information retrospectively to see how it changed from the past. This study also includes an external comparison cohort of families at risk for, but who have never experienced parental deportation. So these are also uh, families with Mexican immigrant parents, U.S. born children, but who have not been uh, subjected to parental deportation. So what we do is first we collect manually, actually we create a database on safe zone policies by looking at the resolutions for uh, individual school districts throughout the entire country. And second, we capture immigration enforcement again through, the, um, uh, through that index that I explained before, which captures several enforcement measures, including secure communities, 287G agreements, E-Verify, and the state um, level immigration laws. So we look at several outcomes here. We look at every, wh whether the student has ever repeated a grade, whether the person gets mostly A's in school, whether the, the student has problems with teachers or problems with students. First, what we see is that immigration enforcement, again, has a very detrimental effect. It increases the probability that a student, remember these are US citizen students, will repeat a grade and decreases the probability that they will earn A's in school. On the positive side, we see that school districts actually have a very positive effect on these outcomes. It decreases the probability of ever repeating a grade, increases the probability of getting A's in school, and lowers the probability that a student will have problems with their teachers or with the students. So we see that there's significant impact of season policies, even when they cannot fully reverse the damaging impact of immigration enforcement. And that is very important. They have a positive impact, but they cannot fully reverse the impact of immigration enforcement. We also look at potential mechanisms at play. 
So here we're going to look at uh, different outcomes to see what are some of the channels through which safe zones could affect children's academic progression. So we look at whether the child has pro uh, problems focusing, whether the child works hard at school, whether they think that they will finish college and beyond, whether a caregiver attends parent-teacher conferences. We want to measure that engagement uh, from caregivers with their schools, and also whether they make friends across racial and ethnic groups. First, we look at immigration enforcement. Once again, we find those very negative effects, um, those areas that are uh, in which we have higher immigration enforcement or the presence of those policies. <clears throat> uh, their uh, students there have a higher uh, uh, time focusing in school. Uh, they tend to work not as hard at school and their engagement, the engagement of their caregivers with the school also drops and they also have more problems with uh, making friends across racial and ethnic groups. But the good, the good news again is that safe, uh, that safe zone policies have positive effects. We see lower probability of problems focusing, higher probability of working hard at school, finishing college, um, that caregiver engagement with the schools and making friends across racial and ethnic groups. And then we, we ask the question, well, what are some of those policy components from the zone policies that are actually having this impact? So we classify those components into two. The first one is whether immigration authorities, ICE, is barred from school campuses or prohibited from entering school premises. And the other one is that a counseling on immigration issues. What we see is that they both, so it is very important that these policies have both components because uh, barring certain or barring immigration authorities has certain positive effects. So lower probability of, focus, of problems focusing, increasing the probability of finishing college, engagement, and making friends across racial and ethnic groups. But counseling is also very important. So not only the active measures in which we prevent law enforcement from entering school campuses, but actually supporting actively the students through counseling and immigration issues. For example, we see that if we provide those counseling um, services, students will tend to work harder at school. Caregivers will continue to attend their parent-teacher conferences and show a higher level of engagement. So overall, some of the mechanisms that we find here is that safe zones prohibit discrimination with regards to academic, extracurricular, and free lunch program based on legal steps. So basically they create an inclusive and welcoming environment for everybody. Second, they provide a physical space in which students and their families have a lower risk of interacting with immigration authorities, thus reducing the psycho-emotional burden of potentially traumatic events on children. Finally, or third, they allocate funds for the creation of information centers that facilitate students' access to financial, legal, and academic resources. And finally, they call for the training of school staff to support students. So it's not only that more information is being provided to students, but actually the staff school uh, or teachers are being trained in how to support students regardless of their immigration status. Um, so in summary, we find that safe zone policies appear to be highly beneficial. In the previous studies, I showed you that there are some very harmful unintended consequences on immigrants, on US citizens and their families. But there are policies such as these are the safe zone policies, which appear to be highly beneficial that shield these students or these communities somehow from uh, immigration enforcement. We find a positive effect on children's focus, motivation, academic expectations, and ability to make friends across races and ethnicities, as well on, on that engagement from caregivers with their um, children's education. We find a cru crucial role of two specific policy components, the first one being keeping ICE away from school campuses, and second, for providing schools or providing students with counseling services. And perhaps most importantly, the results weren't additional research and further consideration of these policies, given their low cost and positive impacts. We see that some of those components, such as keeping eyes away from campuses, are actually very low cost. All it requires is that the school adopts a policy, adopts a, uh, enacts a resolution that prohi uh, prohibits law enforcement activity on their school premises. And that alone can have very positive effects, can have those positive impacts that we found. So overall, what are some of the lessons? And with this, um, I will finish and I will entertain your questions. 
First, we find that immigration enforcement has affected or, or some of those unintended consequences have been that the number of unaccompanied minors under the government has increased. So when we hear about that crisis of unaccompanied minors at the border, now we know that some of the policies that actually that the government enacted has, uh, is, is partially to blame for those for that situation. Second, the educational attainment of immigrants and US citizens has suffered and continues to suffer um, to this day. All of these programs are, are still active. And not only at the individual level, but I also showed you that Hispanics congressional representation, so their, their participation in national elections has also suffered. Now, this is only one part of the literature, but overall we see that the research shows harmful effects on other outcomes including employment and wages of immigrants, their families and communities. Social program participation, we see that children are less likely, even if they are US born, they're less likely to participate in Medicaid, for example. Or individuals are less likely to, um, to report domestic violence. Or youth labor force, uh, or youth labor increases among uh, mixed status households. So none of these outcomes were the intended outcomes of immigration enforcement policies, but I want you to keep in mind that their effects are hurting millions of individuals, even when that was not the intended purpose, they are hurting millions and millions of individuals. So of course, a better understanding of the spillover effects of these policies remains crucial. And I, I, I actually am interested in to see what people think, what are, are, are there some other effects, other policies that we could look into. Thank you. Thank you, um, sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. Buccelli. This was fascinating, um, um, interesting to see how your research builds up on findings about the effects of some of these policies, both positive and negative on uh, not only um, immigrants, but also uh, Hispanic citizens. So I have, I personally have a lot of questions but there are a lot of questions in, in the Q&A session. So I'm gonna just um, try to field those first if there's time, I'll ask mine. Um, <clears throat> so the first question um, is from Thomas Taylor. And he wanted to know if you agreed with uh, Doug Massey's, Massey and, and, and Duran and Friends report on 2016, where they argued that border enforcement emerged as a policy response from, um, to a moral panic, right, uh, about the perceived threat of Latino immigrants uh, into the United States and kind of like put forward by self-interested bureaucrats, politicians and pundits to mobilize political material resources for their own benefit and how this actually perpetuates the cycle of enforcement, increased apprehensions, and then, you know, militarization of the border in a way that actually was completely disconnected from the actual size of undocumented flows. Absolutely, that is a, a very interesting question. And to be honest, when I was doing my research to come well, to prepare for this presentation, but also uh, when I was actually writing the papers, what I found, I was trying to, to find examples or case studies about where these rates have happened, like the, the story that I found about Las Cruces. And what I found was that it doesn't matter the level of immigration, especially with the unaccompanied minors. It doesn't matter the level of apprehensions at the border. It has always been called a crisis. And so I completely agree with, with that example or, or question in that, yes, this is language that has been used to justify in a way the adoption of harsher immigration policies, the militarization of the border, the, the use of coercive measures against immigrants. Because if we are under a crisis, then that justifies taking extraordinary measures. So yes, I, I, I agree with that. And I have found evidence of that. Excellent. Uh, Brianna Medina asks, uh, why is there more of an effect on school enrollment in Hispanic women than in Hispanic men? That is actually a, a very interesting question. Um, I have, to be honest, I have not explored. I have not looked into that. That is something that interests me. We have seen evidence of this, of that gender dimension in several of the studies, not only um, in that educational, uh, um, in school enrollment. Um, 
I'm, I mean, I, I would like to see what what people think. There's something is an area that I would love to look into. Um, yeah, no, it, it definitely is interesting, and um, a, a lot of these dynamics are reproduced. These gender dynamics are reproduced uh, uh, in other, um, not only in schooling, right, but in other areas. So it would be exactly. very interesting to figure out how why. Uh, so maybe maybe food for thought for a, a future paper. Absolutely, thank you to Brianna, was it, who made that question? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Ambassador Delano Lewis asks, how much effort is being done to curtail the root causes of uh, why immigrants are fleeing their home countries? In other words, are there any policies that the United States is implementing to curtail this and, 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 uh, and make the immigrants not feel that they need to immigrate? Emigrate. So I would, uh, to answer that question, I would identify three very clear, distinct periods in the relations between Central America and the US, before Trump, during Trump, and during the pandemic. Before Trump, yes, the US had a very uh, friendly approach to Central America, provided a, lo a lot of resources in terms of foreign aid to these countries to implement uh, programs that would actually help improve the situation, the economic situation, the, devel the economic development of these countries to prevent some of these flows from uh, taking place in the first place. I also use the example of the Obama administration using the CAMP program, the Central American uh, Minor Refugee and Parole Program in which they sought to reunify children. Now, during the Trump administration, much of that aid, actually all of that aid was used as a condition, was even removed from some of those countries, was heavily reduced uh, from those countries, and it was used as a threat. So it was not as here's resources so that it, uh, the countries can, uh, so that I can contribute to the development of these countries, but it was actually, you either prevent your children from your families from leaving your country or I'm remove or I'm withdrawing this money. Or I'm taking this money away. So that is that certainly helped, uh, or I'm sorry, that harmed the, the process, the relationship between the US and Central America. A lot of programs had to end because the resources were not there. And then the third stage during the pandemic, these countries have suffered immensely from, from the pandemic. The economic recovery has just started. Um, so in terms of what we can do, what the US can do to help these countries now, it's, it's even a more daunting task than before. But there are, there are several programs that have been used in the past that have had positive consequences. And I think that we just have to learn more about those to see what works and how. Excellent. Um, uh, Edward Leon asks, what were the effects or what are the effects of harassment of US born young folk at the US border patrol checkpoints during the zero tolerance um, policy? Zero tolerance policy, absolutely. So there was a lot of profiling. Remember I said that during this or before the deactivation of the policy, a lot of these families were turning themselves in to border patrol to request for, for asylum. That was actually uh, what they did is now that border patrol encountered these families crossing the border. But that also contributed to the profiling. Who are these families who are turning themselves in? What do they look like? Where do we also find individuals that look like them? Of course, all along the border. So they were, um, there was an increase in the reported, ICE calls it encounters, but this is actually when ICE checks for the legal uh, status of a person. There was an increase in those encounters with actually US citizens, especially over the past year since the adoption of the zero tolerance pol policy. And part of it is, is, is that profiling. What do individuals look like? What do they tend to look like when they come into the country? Who else looks like them? Let's go and find out the, the legal set of, of these individuals. It's basically profile. Um, so uh, the next question is from Hannah Malik, and she asks, uh, I would love to hear more about your survey development regarding the educational impact of immigrant students. Uh, from the Arizona borders where I see firsthand these outcomes, I would argue that one of your conclusions in summary is incorrect. None of these outcomes were intended uh, intended outcomes. I think the I think cruelty is the point. Whether it is the two two eighty seven G or prevention through deterrence or many other policies for ICE and Border Patrol. Any thoughts? 
I would like to, yeah, I would like to know more about uh, that. Why, why are my conclusions apparently uh, not correct? Uh, what I'm going to say is that some of those questions were not asked directly to students. They were asked to caregivers. So it's the caregiver because a student can say, yes, I have problems focusing, but these are actually observed by other individuals, in some cases even complemented with information from their schools. Uh, I didn't have time, but that, that survey actually was sponsored uh, by the NIH. And um, yes, there's a lot more to, to that survey and a lot of details that I omitted because of, of the time, but I would be more than happy to know more about what, what, is, what is that experience that probably I need to learn more about. Um, great. David Nidell asks, what is the percentage, if you know this, of course, what is the percentage of non-resident migrants seeking asylum in other Latin American countries compared to the U.S.? Um, is immigration law better administered in other countries than the U.S.? And what can be done to keep Congress from continu continuously kicking the proverbial can of immigration reform down the ro road? Well, I can start with an answer to the last question. <laughs> that is going to be, I have no idea, especially today, it's only becoming harder and harder when Congress has become more polarized, the political climate has become even more polarized. Um, to answer the, the, the original questions, I do not know the specific percentages. What I know is that what, when I look at other countries, what I see is that, yes, for example, the application of asylums in Mexico has increased. Again, during the Trump administration, if you uh, remember the re, uh, Remain in Mexico program or returning to Mexico, one of the conditions that Trump imposed, actually one of the threats that he made was, you either stop the migrants from coming to the US or we increase tariffs on your products. As a consequence, of course, the, 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 the Mexican government took a more proactive um, approach. A lot of Central Americans have also started requesting asylum in Mexico, which is significantly more, um, the, the communities where they are arriving are significantly more developed than the original uh, or the communities of origin. Um, so in a way, they, 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 they are in, in a better place. Of course, we all know the problems that afflict Mexico as well. So it's not the ideal situation for refugees who are themselves running for, from violence. Um, another part of the question was, what are approaches that other countries are taking? When I look at the rest of Latin America, for example, the mass migration of Venezuelans escaping the regime in Venezuela to Colombia, what I see is that actually a very friendly approach. Colombia legalized over a million, and this is, keep in mind the relative differences in the population, but Colombia legalized over a million immigrants. They gave them uh, uh, job permits, and this means that these immigrants are now paying taxes. They're contributing uh, to social security. They are enrolling their kids in school. They're investing in businesses. So other countries in Latin America have a more humane approach. It's not as much of a law enforcement problem that needs to be solved, but actually a more humane. How do, how do we make the best use of these resources and how do we welcome these, these, um, these immigrants? So, so this is, a, I, I'm gonna start uh, compiling questions into groups because there's there's a lot which Thank you. <laughs> speaks very well about your presentation and the interest in, in this kind of research. Uh, Ryan McRoberts asks a question and I'm gonna follow it up with uh, uh, Ambassador Delano Lewis's uh, question too because they're related. Uh, Ryan McRoberts asks, what campaigns or advocacy events can we engage in to advocate for these populations? Um, Ambassador Lewis asks, are, are there any groups or organizations pushing for comprehensive immigration reform now? Yeah, so uh, one of the groups that comes to mind is the National Education uh, Association. Actually, the picture that I took or that I included in my presentation for the Safe Zone Policies actually came from their website. So that is certainly a very good option uh, where you can look. One thing that I will emphasize here is that these, the Safe Zone Policies were adopted at the school district level. So I'm going to recommend people who want to see those changes implemented. Run for school board, support your school board. Tell your school board what is it that you need, that your students need, that our communities uh, need to be safer for children to be able to learn. Um, share with them research that has been published. I'd be more than happy to provide these slides or resources that people need, um, but stay engaged. All of these changes that have happened is 
someone proposed this to the school boards and they decided to adopt it. They were, and actually the National Economic uh, or the National Education Association, they even have templates on their website as to what these safe zone resolutions look like so that you can share them with, with school boards around the country. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is, that is uh, appreciated. Uh, Neil Harvey, Dr. Harvey asked, excellent presentation, Dr. Buccelli. Um, can it also be said that the policies were intended to cause harm for immigrants, for example, by using the separation of children at the border on their zero tolerance was actually intended to deter further immigration? So this would be an example of intended rather than unintended consequences. Absolutely. And thank you, Dr. Harvey, for that question. I, I agree with, uh, with your comment. Actually, the, the original title of the presentation was going to be seemingly unintended consequences because, yeah, sometimes even when authorities don't come out and say we are going to separate or the, the objective here is to separate families, to send kids to jail, it is I'm sure that if you look at the legislation, how it was used, it was not something that was improvised. It looks like something that was very deliberate. So when I say unintended consequences, it's probably not the advertised consequence of the policies, not the, the publicized objective of the policy, but sometimes it, it, it's, it certainly could be used in tension, especially the separation of children. Now, other outcomes like the, the political representation, for example, I'm not sure if authorities have thought it, through all of those those outcomes, but in some of those cases, I can see where it might be more intended than unintended. I agree. Indeed, I agree. I, I also agree. Um, Isabel Latz asks: The Biden administration has changed the guidance regarding considering undocumented immigrants a priority for deportation, which Governor Abbott will change in court. What are your thoughts on this, and how this uh, changing guidance might impact the findings you reported? So I think that this situation is part of that lack of action on Congress because there is no legislation, there are no definitive answers or policy, national policies that have been adopted to address the situation. So yes, we are left with this piecemeal approach in which if the executive branch proposes something, individual states might sue the administration. And that's part of the reason why this process is so slow to change, why things over the past 10 years have changed, but have, at the same time have not changed a lot. Now, certainly every president has a lot of, uh, um, of executive discretion when it comes to applying policies. For example, the Obama administration with the application of Trump, of DACA, then Trump res uh, rescinding the, the policy. So what I expect to see is that this back and forth is going to continue, this piecemeal approach is going to continue um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to point out that there was a lot of expectation and optimism as to what the Biden administration could achieve. So yes, they changed the, that definition of priority enforcement, but they have also reinstated the Remain in Mexico program and they, they have expanded it to other countries as well who are not affected in the past. So unless gov uh, Congress acts and settles this, um, passes comprehensive immigration reform, I think that we're only going to continue to see uh, these actions. Um, Yaha Aguilera asks, have you seen the safe zone also implemented in childcare or pre-K education? Um, I have not. So what I've, uh, my database right now, and this was actually hand-coded, uh, I looked at individual school districts. So sometimes childcare centers might be part of a school district, but I have not, the, the short answer is no, I have not looked at the individual childcare centers. And another, uh, another thing that I'm interested in is looking at uh, sanctuary policies at the county or the city level, because that certainly would have, um, would have an, an, another effect. So looking at those options still very interesting. Uh, Steve Sennheiser asks, or Sanister asks, in your research on immigration enforcement, you often use the term, oh no, sorry, uh, Savannah Mesqua, we already asked that, I'm sorry. It's part of the grouping that I have done. Savannah Mesqua asks, under the Hispanic targeting section, you said, these efforts obstructed children's human capital accumulation. Can you elaborate on what that means? Absolutely, this, this might be my economist coming out here. When I say human capital accumulation, that basically means education access to, for example, school enrollment, what I found access to education, but human capital also uh, includes 
Health and Human Services, so access to the Medicaid program, which I, I mentioned. So it's not only education, but it's actually the overall well-being of children. Human capital is just that investment in education, health, and other, other conditions that um, help children. Thank you. And we have, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to uh, have two more questions. Um, uh, Lucinda Vargas asks, regarding Hispanic congressional representatives, there is a split on views on immigration if you're a um, Democrat or Republican, such as such that Hispanic congressional representatives should not necessarily be seen as being sympathetic, sympathetic to the plight of Hispanic immigrants, unaccompanied minors, et cetera, correct? So even if Hispanic representation in Congress increases, it may or may not lead to solidarity with the issues that affect Hispanic immigrants or American born children of Hispanics. What comes to mind, for example, is the view of uh, Ted Cruz versus the view of uh, Veronica Escobar on immigration. Uh, so, does a split among Hispanic Congress representatives on immigration hinder a more resolute federal policy in addressing the unintended negative consequences of the policies you described? Absolutely, and, and another fantastic question that actually allows me to elaborate more on results that I left out, because one of the things that we look at um, in, the, in this project is whether those effects differ by political party. So first, what we see is that that increase in Hispanic political participation is almost entirely driven by the Democratic Party. When we look at Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio, those are outliers in the Republican Party. Most of that increase in representation is actually driven by the Democratic Party. Um, so absolutely, yes, there's going to be a difference in what uh, Ted Cruz defends versus what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez defends, for example. But we see that, that ma the majority of the increase in diversity in the Hispanic representation is coming from the Democratic Party. Very interesting. Um, and lastly, our last question, Cynthia Wise asks, I appreciate your presentation on this matter. I wonder if you might speak to US citizens living in Mexico who cross the border every day to attend public schools, some as young as four years old, who are questioned daily about their citizenship status, why they're entering the US, and what they intend to do in this country. Uh, first, I, I, I want to thank all the presenters um, or all the, all the questions that I've done for this presentation. But that actually, uh, this question opens up a, uh, another set of policies that we could look into. Uh, while you were asking that question, I was thinking, imagine when the border was closed during the pandemic, how all of those children were affected. So to the best of my knowledge right now, I have not seen any policies that have been directly targeted to support those individuals or to even to help them throughout uh, through, through the pandemic in, in the moment of crisis. But to be honest, I'm, I have not seen any policies that have been implemented to support the, these children. Yeah, and, and a very interesting question too, because, um, you know, it, this is something that has happened historically, right? In, in border towns, I mean, uh, kids cross. My mother used to cross every day to go to school uh, when she was a, a little girl in, in, in the Tijuana border. And, um, and she tells me stories about how different it was before, right? It's like, she wouldn't even be asked. Sometimes she would forget her passport and, and the person at the border knew her because she crossed every day and be like, okay, but don't forget your passport next week or your visa next week. Um, so it is an interesting thing to for, perhaps start figuring out, you know, longitudinally over time, how much of that has changed, of course, you know, and some of those unintended consequences. Is it barring some people from, from crossing? Absolutely. Um, and that, that is a very interesting perspective. And I wish that more people knew about that, how there was there and still is, there's this back and forth movement, people who come and go every single day. It's not like if if, a, if an immigrant from Central America or Mexico comes, they're going to be lurking in the shadows all of it and, and waiting for, for resources. No, people come and go. Uh, part of my research looks at return migration, and I see that what people do when they go back to their countries of origin. So yeah, many, many topics that um, still need to be researched. Uh, Dr. Buccelli, I want to thank you so much for being here with us for a fascinating presentation. You got incredible engagement. Uh, people were very interested in your research, obviously. So we hope to hear from you soon with more uh, interesting research. Um, I want to thank everyone that participated in uh, this event. 
in the chat uh, asking questions. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Muchas gracias. Um, thank you, and thank you, thank you, everyone who attended the presentation. I appreciate this opportunity to um, uh, share my my work. Thank you, everyone. See you, see you all, everyone, uh, next uh, month for our next speaker in our speaker series. Again, we posted in the chat our social media if you want to follow us and our uh, list serve if you want to be added to it so you know beforehand about these events. Muchas gracias a todos. Nos vemos a la próxima.